My, uh, my name is Dennis McDermott, the alumni th director. On behalf of our chairman, John Tully, our president, Dr. Miguel martinez Sines, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Also on behalf of Thomas Flood and the development staff and the alumni staff. Terry is in guest. Special congratulations to the class of 1968 to celebrating 50 years. We welcome you to the Golden Terriers Club. We want to remember our deceased alumni and remember Frank Macchiarola and Brendan Dugan who would, would, would have been celebrating his 50th anniversary. Before our president, Dr. Miguel Martinez Sainz, addresses all of you, I would like to say a few hundred words. I, <laughs> I, I, I mentioned that I mentioned that I was the alumni director for the last 17 and a half years. On June 1st, I will be retiring my position as alumni director. I want to thank the Franciscan brothers, the administration, the staff, the faculty, the students, my classmates, my teammates, my coaches for all the support over the years. I would like to tell all of you about my journey at St. Francis College. And it's not just my journey. It is about most of you and your journeys. It started in the early 60s on Butler Street. My family lived on Baltic Street on the back side of St. Francis College. My parents worked hard for myself and my sister. My father was a grocery man. My mother did whatever odd jobs she can do. My mother worked in the cafeteria at St. Francis College, cleaning tables. I observed at an early age what respect was all about. This past year, during our St. Clair and St. Francis week, our president spoke about hospitality and how you judge people. And the theme was that you judge people by observing what they do and how they live their life. When I was sitting around in the cafeteria, uh, in the corner of the cafeteria years ago watching my mother, I would watch how the college students treated my mother. My mother was a tough Irish woman, but these students gave her the ultimate respect. I had an eye for talent at an early age. Frank Macchiarola was the uh, president of the student body, and he always said to my mother, how are you doing? How is everyone treating you? My grandmother lived a mile away, and I would go down there and watch the guys, the older guys, play in the park on the weekends. And I got a chance to watch Brendan Dugan, how he handled himself. So I had an eye for talent, as I said. They set the foundation, knowing how to treat others. There were a few other things that happened during this period of my life. My mother always came home with tokens, and I couldn't figure why. And my mother was, you know, always respected the uh, students, and they would sell her the tokens because they were thirsty, and they wanted to go to the Eagle or to McLaughlin's Bar, and she gave them <laughs> some money, and we had a house full of tokens. I played basketball in the parking lot. I don't know if you remember, there was a hoop in the parking lot. I had Brother Cosmos, you know, help me with my homework. So I don't know if it's me or the way Brother Cosmos, you know, interpreted things, you know, that I wasn't a great student. Is, so I would go out and play basketball and shoot, uh, shoot around the hoops in the uh, parking area. And, uh, you know, I, it, it left a bit of taste in my mouth at that time because say if it was three guys and they needed a fourth and I was around 12 years old they said well if it was five guys they needed a six they said okay now you're going to play with us but when you catch the ball you do this this and this and you pass it to one of the other guys and you know I, I just said you know that's not really a lot of fun so as my career as I got involved in basketball uh, what happened is when I started playing team basketball they would pass me the ball and I didn't want to pass the ball back. I figured I did all my passing at an early age. <laughs> the, college moved, the college moved to Remsen Street. My mother moved to St. Francis Prep. She worked in the friary in the school. And in the eighth grade, you know how everyone, you know, if they get their uh, acceptance into uh, high school and everything's great and everything like that. My sister was very smart, you know. So I was rejected from every Catholic high school. I did apply even to cathedral, figuring maybe I'd become a priest. Could you, President Miguel, could you imagine me being a bishop of Brooklyn and dealing with me? <laughs> I, uh, so my mother went to Brother David at the time, the principal, and he, uh, she said, you know, my son didn't get accepted. He goes, oh, that's a mistake. So three days later, I was accepted. I'm sure many of my classmates in grammar school said, oh, he got accepted into St. Francis because of his mother. 
After I was accepted, my father was concerned about the tuition and how we, they were going to pay it. My, so, my mother said she would check in with Brother David. I overheard my mother the following week tell my father that Brother David said he would send the bill. I'm all set at St. Francis Prep. I was in class 107. That was the favorite class. So the Franciscans were smart. They started us out 101 to 107. And um, every, all 35 of us were in on a favor. So realized at an early age, too, there was no cheating in our class. You know, like the one time a guy said, uh, you know, like I studied last night, and then when we got the test back, the guy says, you know, I thought you said you studied. He said, yeah, I studied, but I didn't tell you I knew what, what I was doing, uh, you know. So for the whole four years, we just, you know, we were honest. For French, we had, uh, sophomore year, we had a French class, and by accident, our junior year, a new teacher came in, and we repeated the same French class, and we repeated the same grades also. We didn't improve. And then I started in, uh, settling into different activities, track, which that didn't work out too long, and basketball. And I, must, I watched my mother work. You know, she had friary was great. Um, uh, she worked with a woman, an African-American woman, Lucille. So whatever the brothers ate, I had the same lunch. And I just had to go across the street and get it. And I watched that she also worked in a school afterwards to make extra money. And it was tough watching your mother or our mothers or fathers, you know, on her knees, cleaning the halls, the steps, or cleaning the bathrooms. And I was around my, you know, sophomore, junior year. That's when I realized I had a secret contract with my parents, just like all of you. My parents did whatever they had to do to make it better for me and my sister. My part was to live life in a good way. Work hard, respect your, respect your family name, plain and simple, don't mess up and make us proud. I played varsity basketball, um, uh, varsity B basketball uh, up until my uh, sophomore and junior year and then my senior year, I was the eighth man on my high school team. And uh, c come around April, uh, I had no scholarship offers. You know, I was really thin at the time. And uh, I wouldn't call it, the, there was no scholarship offers. And one night we get a phone call from Mr. Lynch, the athletic director here at St. Francis College, and Lester Yellen. Now you can imagine Lester Yellen talking to me, the conversation, how that went, you know? So they called the house and they offered me a scholarship. My father came home that night and my mother said that I was going to St. Francis College on a scholarship. I never even said yes, but I'm going to St. Francis College. <laughs> I'm sure my classmates at the time was heard I had received a scholarship and they said, oh yeah, because of his mother, she had the connections. Does that sound familiar? High school and college because of my mother? I entered St. Francis College, played freshman ball. Four of my uh, uh, cl uh, cl teammates in high school attended the college with me, and two of them were ineligible. They weren't in class 107 at the prep. I had the premier job here at St. Francis College that while I was waiting until January to get it is uh, for the you know, student athlete is the mail room, I did the mail room, I did uh, the switchboard, and I had every, the, the faculty needed to get some of the classrooms open, I had the, well, I had the keys. So, but prior to that, I worked in the, uh, October that year, I worked in the business office. And then in my uh, late October, their new administrator came in, and she was really strict, and you know, she ran a tight ship, and I used to come in and talk to the women working and everything like that. And just one day she couldn't take, you know, listening to me in the background. So she said, why don't you go downstairs and, you know, be the guy's assistant until uh, January. So I went downstairs and I started uh, working, and as I said, in the mail room and doing other things. And then in the summer, I had a difficult job in the summer. Now, they wanted me to, like, do this, do that. I had to come in. I had to have breakfast. I had to relieve the woman on the switchboard. I had to work out for two hours. I had to take a nap. Uh, and I had to deliver, you know, the, the mail. I mean, you're asking too much here, you know? So in the second year, things are falling into place. So started scoring a couple more points. And then um, in late January of that year, they had someone come down to the switchboard and relieve me, right? And they said, you know, we don't want you to be overworked and everything like that. So they sent down a co-ed and uh, she came down and she was standing in front of me and I was sitting at the switchboard and uh, I st she said, oh, I'm, they sent me down and I stood up, I said, hi, my name is Dennis McDermott. 
And she says, my name is Kathy Cusimano. And I proceeded to teach her the switchboard. Th three months later, I asked her to have lunch with me. So we walked down Montague Street, and we went to Lassen and Henny, and we walked the promenade, and we sat on the promenade. And we have been walking together for the last 47 years. We are the proud parents of our son, Brian. Brother, uh, Brother uh, George would always say to Kathy, Kathy, how do you do it? And Kathy would say, Brother, he makes me laugh more than he makes me cry. We graduated together. Kathy graduated in three years. She wanted to catch the big fish, and did she ever get the big fish? <laughs> and our strong relationship with the college, the Franciscan brothers. Kathy's middle name, Brenda, is named after her cousin, who was a Franciscan at the time, Brother Brendan. Kathy's mother worked here in the alumni office at St. Francis College. Her two brothers attended St. Francis College, and her sister-in-law attended St. Francis College. You, you're getting this? Thing? I'm a real world traveler, right? <laughs> They retired my number back in uh, 1987. Through I had many of, uh, they thought I had money from Wall Street and you know, or they were covering a hole on the wall, you know? Were they surprised? So I'm the only number that they retired. And I'm not the type of person, seriously, you know, like to brag. I know, uh, you know, like a woman when they get engaged, when they get engaged, you know, they walk around like this. Right? So a couple of years ago, they gave me a number 22, you know, and I walk around like this, right? And every once in a while, too, you know, just because I'm the only number retired, where is it? Must be nice. Maybe, maybe I wear my sweater, St. Francis College, with the number 22, right? Around school so people know who I am. Is I was on it in 2015. Uh, at the Madison Square Garden as a legend, right, of, uh, of St. Francis, uh, of uh, the ECAC. I never played a game at Madison Square Garden. I ate and I drank at Madison Square, <laughs> and I talked at Madison Square Garden. You know, can I tell you all this? It is not about me, and so I'm so proud when people say to me, oh, St. Francis College, St. Francis College. That makes me so proud. And I'm sure all of you are proud of your alma mater. In 2000, I get a phone call from Eddie Aquilon, who was working with Frank Macchiarola at the time, and he said they were looking for an alumni director. And I said, well, what does it entail? He said, well, you know, you got to you know, bring people together and, uh, you know, uh, run different, like, golf outings and dinners and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, they'll have a development person, you know, taking care of the money and everything like that. I called him two days later, and I said, I have someone. I said, me. And it brought me back to the college. And I was blessed, right? For 17 and a half years, I had Donna working with me and Vanessa for the last 16 and a half years. And I thank the both of them for their support. I thank e each and every one of you, again, for all your support. And a difficult part of the job, or a difficult part of St. Francis College here, we're a family. You know, it's good, hopefully, today we can remember this and talk about the good things and enjoy ourselves. But when people are sick or people are down or, or, or funerals that we have to go to, I watched the people from the early 60s. They had a, 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 one of their classmates. And they made me part of their life. You know, hey, we got to do this. We got to do that to rally around them. One of my uh, fellow uh, uh, fraternity brothers was sick, Andy Verger, and we had to go down to see him, and it was five of us you know, down in New Jersey, and you don't care where you're going. You know, you get in a car, guys were drinking coffee, they're popping pills, like, you know, now, not the pills that they popped 40 years ago, they're popping blood pressure pills, and, uh, <laughs> and we're, sitting, we're sitting in the hospital, you're sitting in the hospital just talking and reminiscing. And then Andy lasted like uh, another year or so, and then we went to visit him like two weeks prior. And I was the youngest of uh, these guys that were visiting him, and it was, you know, he said, I'll have a little beer. And he took a sip of beer and was like, you know, his farewell party. And we all get in the car afterwards. And just the feeling was like unbelievable. After 40, 45 years that they still had this friendship. Is, uh, tell you uh, two stories. My, uh, well, two stories, I don't have any going on. Is, uh, 
one time they had a, we had the alumni dinner and we had a little individual get together, cocktail receptions. And uh, they had a reception in, one, in a library for about 30 people. And uh, I don't know if you remember if it was uh, Frank or Brendan. And I just got up and I introduced, I said, you know, welcome and everything like that. And I stepped to the side and a guy came around. He said, well, Dennis, tell him who you are, right? And I, I didn't know what he meant, you know. He said, tell him who you are. Some of these guys don't know who you are. Mary McDermott's son, right? And I went, wow, you know, and it was, and it was a touching moment. Is, uh, and the number 22, the number 22, I'm not bigger than the number 22. That 22 is part of all of you, a piece of that, hanging in the gym. It's part of my mother, it's part of my father, my sister, my relatives, right? And I was just fortunate that my number is retired. But there was one individual that thought I was bigger than that number one day is so they poly prep out in the bay ridge was playing a, a school the upper room school here and they had to play on a neutral court so i was the administrator in the building but they had everyone covering the athletic department had everyone covering downstairs so i had to come down in and out at times just to check and see how everything was going on so the young man comes out of the game we had the bleachers on the one side where the fans were and they had the, uh, you know, the benches on uh, the other side. So there's, a, there's an elevator in the corner. I came out of the elevator to go out and to go to the other side just to talk to someone and see how everything's going. But as I'm walking behind the bench, the player coming out, the, you know, he just come out uh, of the game, he reaches out and he shakes my hand. I'm figuring, why is he shaking my hand? I think he thought I was a scout. You know, like, uh, I think he thought I was Tom Kanchowski or something, you know? So, so he shakes my hand. We go up, I go back and forth. After the game, uh, Polly Press lost, I think, in double overtime or whatever. And this young man is standing on the top of the key with his uncle or whatever. And I'm, I'm inviting people upstairs from Polly to my office for refreshments. And I look at this young man and I say, no, hey, how are you? I say, congratulations. And I said, uh, let me ask you a question. Why did you, you know, shake my hand when you came out of the game? Right? And he like, looked at me, he got a little nervous, and he stepped back. And he goes, uh, well, who are you anyway? Oh my. So I pointed up towards the banner, right? So he goes, no. He goes, no. You're St. Francis? <laughs> my, f my father always taught me to work, work for good people. And I had a, some career, a fantastic career, working for uh, Brendan, uh, Brendan and Frank and with Miguel. So the first day I go to speak to Miguel and tell him that I'm retiring, uh, retiring he goes, okay, and he, you know, he thinks it out. He says, you know, you know, we'll keep you around, do something, you know, like maybe work the mailroom or, uh, you know. <laughs> so he said, he goes like this, and I said, this is gonna be great. They, you know, he says, you hang, you, we'll give you a special assistant to the president. I said, this is gonna be fantastic. I'm gonna look forward to this. You know, I don't need an office. I could sit outside uh, with, you know, the administrative staff right outside your door. I could be right, right there. So, he, you know, he left, and then later that day, I saw Macter in uh, Alexandria, and they, were, they said, what did you say to the president? I said, I just told him, like, you know, I'm happy, and, you know, he wants me around. He wants me outside the door there, and everything like that. So two days later, I get a phone call from HR, you know, saying, okay, Dennis, we're gonna, you're going to do this, this, and this. But the president was saying, maybe you can work from home. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you about our 19th president. My first meeting uh, with Miguel I went to meet him and said, you know, I'm the alumni director and everything like that. And this Kathy that night said, well, you know, so how do you stand with him? I said, uh, we had a 40 minute meeting and 38 minutes was spent on talking about the students. He said, but she said, didn't you talk about, you know, where do you stand? I said, yeah, we, you know, we talked about the students. And now if the students have a good experience here and they go on, they're going to have a good relationship with their college. So it was plain and simple. And then we've had other discussions. But that, that was it. During his inauguration, I don't know if any of you were here, people got up and talked about uh, Miguel. And they said during the interview process that how kind he was, how caring, how sincere, how intelligent. And he spoke mostly about the students. He talked to them about their mission and their values and the goals that he had. They're not his goals. They're our goals. 
and he needs to carry out the goals. And all of us, needs to, all of us need to support him in any way we can. We thank all of you for your support over the years. Yes, we need your money. We also need you to be ambassadors, to go and tell people about the small college of big dreams. Tell your friends, your family members, and how the great education you received while you were here. Again, I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. God bless all of you. And now I introduce our president, Dr. Miguel Martinez Sainz. First time I gotta bring a microphone down, usually I get to bring it up, but I got some stories. I had a plan, but my plan has changed, and some of you know that I manage improvisation sometimes well, and so he's allowed me to improvise. I wanna share a number of stories, but bring some levity to it, and then uh, bring some more substance to it. But, you know, I just learned today, Kathy told me something that was very insightful. Um, so uh, I'll tell you how I met Dennis. He's forgotten how I met him, but uh, I'll, I'll remind him of that as he puts his sweater back. Um, so Kathy uh, says to me today, you know, I'm not sure you are aware, but Dennis is a character. <laughs> Hello. I mean, <laughs> I knew that from day one. And let me tell you what day one was. So I gotta, I gotta get a couple stories here. Some of you've heard one or two of these, but I actually met uh, Dennis McDermott when I was interviewing. I was told as part of the process, it was a closed search. Closed search for a president has become more common. Generally, just so you don't, if you don't know, generally when you do searches for presidents and, and deans, there are public forums, there's a bunch of hoopla, and, 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 and we, we get to meet everybody. But it's become difficult because sometimes when you're in a presidential search, your president, if you're not a president at the time, or your board, if you're a president at the time, gets a little bit irritated that you're actually looking for another job. So create some friction. So they've begun closing these searches. And so they, they, they said they were going to bring me to the campus, which I want to be clear about one thing. I think these are five buildings. We've got a campus that extends way beyond these five buildings. And, and that's one of the things we, we want to try to talk about. But so they said, okay, we're going to take you in. I think Rob Oliva and I see Alexandria. They were my escorts. And I mean, just think about this. I think it was June 23rd. It was pretty close to that date, if it's not that date exactly. And they said, uh, the search firm says, you can't talk to anybody. What? I said, you can't talk to anybody. They're not supposed to know. It's a closed search. And I said to Sheila Murphy, and she'll confirm this, and I said, okay, I mean, I don't know, these people must not be very bright. I mean, I'm gonna be escorted around this campus in a suit in June, and they're not gonna know that I'm one of the candidates? And he's like, well, you got a good point, but you're not supposed to talk to anybody. So Rob and Alexandria bring me into the building, they take me downstairs, and the first stop, uh, Tom Giovato, some of you know him, he's a, he's a soccer coach. That guy talks more than me and Dennis combined. Try to wrap your head around that one. Uh, so he comes out of his office and he says, hey, how you doing? I said, I'm doing all right, how you doing? And he's, we started talking and Rob and Alexandria, you might recall, stepped back and thought, oh God, here we go. This guy's gonna start talking to everybody. So I did and one of the things I wanted to do is get a feel for the texture of the people. You know, I say the closed searches make sense, but you got to feel the texture of who you're going to be working with because as, as Dennis uh, has noted, it's about community, it's about relationships and how they're formed and if, if it makes sense, if there's an alignment. And I think it's an alignment of spirit. The second, I met a few people in between, but the second person that was notable actually was Dennis McDermott. So they, they, they brought me through the alumni. I don't know where we were coming. Oh, we're coming from Genovese, I think. We we're coming through the alumni. And so Dennis happened to be in his office, and so you could imagine that neither he or I decided not to talk. So um, we, we spent some time um, talking, and again, what I was trying to feel was, was the place. And, and Dennis, for me, um, is emblematic of what it is that is good about this place um, in many, many ways. 
um, whether it's, he talked about it, attending people's funerals. Um, some of you know my mother was very ill and passed in December. The attention that our family received um, what was, it was moving. Uh, I was new to the space. I wasn't a part of the space. It's different when you're talking about somebody you have a 40-year relationship with and how attentive you are. And so somebody that started uh, here September 1 and, and the community knows what we're going through as a family. I mean, the receptivity of that was, was unbelievable. And it's a testament to the community formation that takes place. And, and Dennis McDermott is certainly uh, instrumental. Um, and just so we're all clear about some of the stories that he told, some of them were embellished. Um, I never once said that he would have to work from home. I said he should go work in Maine or something like that. But, but, no. no. Uh, I will say this, that I, I was uh, surprised uh, when Dennis approached me um, about stepping down. Um, so very quickly, he tells the story in a way I was shocked, but very quickly I knew I had to pivot because he was pretty firm in his decision to retire. But I knew that he needed to stay part and parcel of this place. He needed to stay connected to the place. So, so my, I was groping quickly to make sure that he understood that he needed to stay connected and formally connected to this place. And so that's what we need. And you know, some of the things in terms of just reflecting on that, the connections we need from you uh, extend beyond um, a, what sometimes people think is always about the money. It's not, I don't think it's actually about the money. My fundamental belief, it's about the relationships. The money follows the relationships. And what Dennis is, is testifying to is that it's about the relationships. You'll understand where the gaps are. You'll understand where we need help. You'll understand when our students need a helping hand. I was just on the phone today talking to somebody about trying to position a first year student in a part time job so he can stay in the area so he doesn't have to go back to a dysfunctional environment uh, in his home in upstate New York. And it's about the relationships that make that, right, that, that allow that to, to materialize. And so this is one of the things that I, I want to emphasize. I did learn today. I, I learned, I, you know, I love these things. I'm going to tell five more stories, um, but not really. But I learned, some, I learned something great every time. So one of the things I learned today that, and Dennis, uh, Dennis doesn't know, but he's going to demonstrate now, that his dance instructor, who's here today. Mrs. Yeah, yeah, I know. You introduced me to her. Um, actually is the reason that Dennis said the school record. Um, that's what I was told today, because she was teaching him ballet. And before the ballet instructions, you know, he was a little bit, he wasn't light on his feet, but the ballet lessons are actually the cause of Dennis's prowess as a basketball player. So he didn't tell you that part of the story. Um, reflection on Bishop McDermott. I mean, really let that sit. And, I wouldn't have taken the job. I mean, <laughs> uh, no, but again, I think uh, this is what it means to be Franciscan. And I mean this firmly. Um, you know, he talked about the conversation on hospitality. I'll bring some levity to it. It is the first time. Some of you may have heard me say this. Some of you were here witnessing it. I didn't do this, Dennis, because this isn't the roast. There's going to be a roast, and this isn't it. But we have it on video. It's the only time in Dennis McDermott's life where he was speechless. Are you going to deny that? <laughs> so we were having a conversation on hospitality, and I wanted to share what, some brief thoughts on that. But Dennis McDermott was sitting actually about where Carl or Edwin are sitting over here on the left. And I was trying to get the students engaged to, to reflect on what it means um, to, to really be committed to hospitality. And one of the things that I think is important is not only you open your doors, but you invite folks to the banquet. And that means that you gotta go into those spaces, right? I mean, that's one of the things that Christ teaches us. You gotta go into the space. You don't just hope that people show up. And I think this is one of the things that also Dennis does. And I think a lot of people on this, on this campus does. And I was trying to get folks to feel that 
it's 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 bi-directional. We got to get more proximate. This is a Brian Stevenson thing. And so I went over to Dennis, and I forgot the question because he, he shocked me. I had known him. I, I don't know. That was the, probably the first week of October, Alexandria. So I had I had known him for some some time. So I knew that he talks a lot, right? And so me and him, it's just a question about who's going to talk more and. And so I went there, and there was some reticence in the crowd, right? So they're not used to, usually the speakers are here, and they're, they're not there. So I had a microphone, and I walked out, and I was trying to get students to engage, and they weren't engaging. So I thought I had a foolproof plan, right? I get in front of Dennis McDermott. I ask Dennis McDermott a question. He starts talking. Everything works itself out. Failure. I mean, I get to Dennis, ask him a question, and this is him. I'm like, Dennis, <laughs> stage fright, never seen it before. So now all of a sudden I'm unraveling, so we had to get it on record. So I know the camera spun there. And he talked to me after about why he didn't speak. He said he was sick, but that's not quite true. But again, why I wanted to move him into the space is for the young people also, there were a lot of students, for them to see, you know, there's a legacy of good work. There's a legacy of Franciscan education and it's in the space and, and, and he, he certainly represents that. And for me, you know, one of the things I said at the installation is, what does the world need now? That was the title of my installation. If you haven't seen, we got a word, word cloud. Um, if you're walking towards the cafeteria, look to the left, I've put that up in honor of of, of uh, my parents. Uh, my mom died December 13, 2017. My father passed June 13, 1992. And uh, what happened was I, was I was reflecting on what I was going to talk about. And, and I put it in a word cloud. I was, I was a little bit stuck. And I said, you know, I'm just going to play around with technology. I put it in a word cloud. And by chance, the word cloud came out like a fish. And the students were right at the center. So if you take a look at it, that wasn't a contrived piece. That was simply what my speech was put into a word cloud and what came out is what uh, I think is not coincidentally what was important, which is students is the biggest expression. And I think that's one of the things we're called to do is, is, is how to engage our students and how to get them to understand right, how privileged we are. And I mean that in a broad sense, uh, to be able to have the experiences we've had uh, absolutely critical. One of the things I like to remind folks that on 9-11, and this was something that was shared with me, um, St. Francis College alum were front and center, right? So some of you will know better than I that Thomas Von Essen was leading the fire department at the time, 72 grad. When there was a death, he asked another alum to serve. Michael Regan stepped up to serve. Fian was at the NYPD and Michael Regan was at the Office of Emergency Management. I think that's a history that we need to keep alive, and we need to keep our young people to understand that lives of service and devotion to others are absolutely fundamental to what we do. And one of the things that we need to do a little differently, in my view, is be Franciscans, but Franciscans that amplify our voice, amplify what it is that's happening at this college. And I think we haven't done that a little bit, partly because of our humility. But really the power of what's happening in this place is, is just remarkable. And I, I try to remind folks, we got a lot of alums, if I look around here, a lot of alums are on staff. And sometimes they don't know what's going on on other campuses. I've had the good fortune of being on different institutional, different institutional types and different college campuses. What happens in this environment is truly special. There's no question about it. Everybody likes to say it, but we do it in ways that I'm not even sure. I actually don't know what it is, but there's something here in the water. The relationships that are formed, the attention we pay, you know, uh, Dennis talked about the relationship to his mother, how folks treated his mother, and I have some cabinet members here. For me, that's fundamental. You know, in the cabinet, if, if they're here, they won't attest to it, but, or they may. My second week on campus, I came into a cabinet meeting and I said, I'm going to be very clear about one of my expectations. Every one of you will greet everybody when you come into this space, the concierge, the security, and the people cleaning. Every one of you will do that. And when you go get food, you're going to talk to folks. Because that's important. It's fundamentally important. I said, I'm going to have zero tolerance for not seeing that engagement. 
Because what we're doing is not only demonstrating that we believe in the dignity of every person, but we're also educating our students so that they understand that these folks cannot be treated as if they're invisible. And this is a Franciscan commitment. This is one of the things I think Dennis is, is, is reflecting on and one of the things Dennis does. We, we can do this on a daily basis. I was just at St. Anthony's yesterday and I was telling those young people we were talking about selfishness. And I was saying, look, you have a way to demonstrate a lack of selfishness daily by the way you attend to people, the way you pay attention to people, the way you acknowledge their presence. And our students need to learn that, that that's been part and parcel of a Francis, uh, St. Francis College education. So my commitment, yes, is to grow enrollments as enrollments have dipped, but really more important is to reaffirm a commitment to relationship, a commitment to being close in proximity, right? Not only in terms of physically, but understanding. Again, I think, you know, one, one last story, one of the things that I was moved by, we had, a, we had a woman who had worked here for some time and she got ill and Dennis was leaving and I said, what are you doing? And he says, I gotta go to the hospital. She doesn't have family here and we gotta coordinate visits. She needs to understand that she matters and we're her family. That means we have an obligation to move into the space and to make sure people are in this space. I think if we testify to the world that it is possible to live lives of loving service and compassion, the world will take notice. And I think we could do that daily and our students need to do that for us as well. And one of the ways that they can do that is by engaging with you so the way you give your talent and your time is absolutely critical for us to let the world know that it is possible to live fully human lives of loving service, compassion, and, if you will, mercy. I thank you for your presence and thank you for your support. Okay, now the schedule, uh we have gifts for everyone. I got to tell you uh, one more story about gifts. So, last year I get you know people. Uh, when's my last day? June first or whatever. June second, I'll be happy as anything. Dennis, do you have a T-shirt? Dennis, do you have a hat? So last year I get sick, uh, setback. Where am I? I'm here. David and Brenny and uh, uh, the nurse, uh, the nurse Liz, right? And uh, Tom Flood and Vanessa are standing off to the side, right? And they were concerned. So I had a health, uh, health issue. So, and I know the, uh, the Vanessa told me like a month later, Tom was really concerned because he wanted to make sure I was a member of the St. Clair Society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I, wait, I go to the doctor, I go to the hospital, we're in the hospital. Can't breathe. Kathy says, you know, she told me through, just shut up. I have the oxygen on me. Who's there? This is a public service uh, announcement for the school. This young man is there, nurse. So I had my St. Francis, you know, uh, sh vest on, and he goes to Kathy. Well, I went to St. Francis, right? And he had the uh, a CC bracelet. She says, "Oh, did you?" Uh, and I get excited, right? When you say went to St. Francis, oh yeah, you know whatever. He graduated in May and got a job in June, which was great at Methodist Hospital. And he says, um, you know, uh, the, the bracelet. He goes, no, that's the only thing they gave me at graduation. This guy's shaking me down for a hat, a shirt. <laughs> I finally, I sent it to him a month later. I said, can you at least take care of me first and I'll give it to you, you know? <laughs> so it happens all over. So we have gifts for everybody today. So today we're gonna take some photos of the uh, uh, Golden Terriers. The 50 year class just has to wait. Uh, you'll be the last one. And then we're gonna, the Genovese Center is on the fourth floor. The restrooms are right there. The uh, ladies room and the men's room is on the side. You can take the escalator up to the fourth floor if you need help. We have people outside to take the elevator up. We'll have uh, lunch if you know tours. If you want to uh, hang around and uh, take a tour later, you're more than welcome to take a tour. 
Um, and I always say, okay, and then we, we say, okay, we entertain you and say, okay, get out of here. It's up to you. You could stay till 5, 10 o'clock at night. But just remember, there's traffic out there, you know? Like, so, again, I thank everyone uh, for coming. Let's all enjoy our day and tell some good stories.